Well, I'm not an expert. I'm not an authority. I'm someone who has been a murderer for almost 20 years. Maybe I should have killed four or 500 people, then I would have felt better. People say Ted Bundy didn't show any emotion. There must be something in that. I showed emotion. You know what people said? See, you really can't get violent and angry. Welcome to The Squonk and the Hag, a podcast about murder, mystery, the supernatural, and even a conspiracy or two. Dun, dun, dun. My name is Mo. And I'm Kraken. And this week, we are kicking off the spooky season with some interesting tales from our buddy Krakow. So more Krakow tales. Krakow tales. Hooray! This time it's it's like dragon tales, but it's actually, you know, just frog tales. This one was actually researched by Ranger. He did a really good job in putting in all the details, so I didn't actually have to go dig for anything else. It's all in here. This is why I absolutely love having Allie and Ranger on the team, because they make yes. things easy. <laughs> yes. Like, th- there's th- there's so, so many fine details in here, and it's just, like, perfect. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's like, sometimes you and I do like to, you know, we like to dig in to certain stories and things like that. Like, I know for me, the local cases really grab my attention, and you have your crazy off-the-wall things that we have no idea how you find them. Then Ranger and Allie come in with these other ones that, first of all, I wouldn't have thought to look into. And second of all, they do just, I want to learn how to research like them, Krakow. They, 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 they're, they're the ones that know what they're doing. We, we have no idea what we're doing. I mean, I'm pretty sure that's obvious. I'm pretty sure every single person like is like, oh, those two, they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> but somehow we manage. <laughs> somehow we manage. I'm going to chalk it all up to Bubba. I'm pretty sure he is the reason we get anything accomplished. Yes, Bubba's the good luck charm. Yeah, Bubba is snoring right now. Wonderful. All right, This episode so... will just be an hour of Bubba snoring. Oh, man. That cat. I, I think he needs, Chris always jokes, he needs a little CPAP machine. Oh my god, I tell my dog he needs the same thing. Oh, little animal CPAP machines. How cute would those be? They just got a little cart for the machine, and then you put the little mask on, and you put the little cart beside them. Yeah, and they just have this tiny little mask, and they look like little, um, you know the bad guy from the Mad Max movie with uh, oh god, Charlie yes. Theron? <laughs> and then it's just a little cat with a mask on. I mean, we did Photoshop a Bane mask onto him at one point. I still have that photo, by What's the way. What's this Wii stuff? I didn't do anything. Okay, fair enough. Still. All right. We got anyway. off topic quick this week. <laughs> yes, off to a wonderful start. All righty. So why don't you hop in, anyway, take it away, Krakow. One, our first one is, and I'm going to butcher all of these names because lucky for me, there's a, it, all of both of these take place in and around Scotland. So there's a bunch of Gaelic names that I have no clue how to pronounce. But thankfully, Ranger included a breakdown of how to pronounce them. It's almost like he knew I was going to be reading this. But our first story is The Gray Man of Ben McDewey. I, I wondered who or what Ben McDewey was because it sounds like someone's name. I quickly found out that's actually the second highest mountain in Scotland. Uh, so it's a place? Yeah, it's a mountain. Ben McDewey uh, is the second highest mountain in Scotland and the other English Isles after Ben Nevis. And it's the highest mountain in the Cairngorms. The summit elevation is around 1,309 meters, or if you convert it, it's 4,295 feet above sea level. But Ben McDewey lies on the southern edge of the Cairngorm Plateau on the boundary between the historic counties of Aberdeenshire and Banffshire. The Cairngorms, which it comes up a lot, which is a really cool name, it's a range of mountains in the northern portion of Scotland. It's home to the only and last bit of natural pre-human forest in Scotland. What? It's the Caledonian Forest. It's yep. 9,000 years old. <gasps> really? and it is home to many rare species of animals. This forest is also supposedly one of the areas that King Arthur fought one of his 12 battles, and it also has ties to Merlin who fled there in a fit of madness. The Cairngorms also have the only reindeer herd in the United Kingdom. They were brought in by a Swedish herder and the population has now grown to like 150. Whoa, that's awesome. I now kind of want to see this forest, this this really old forest, because I bet it looks creepy and cool. And I bet, like, it's one of those ones with those the big trees with, like, the dark bark. Like, I don't know why. I'm just assuming yeah. it's dark. 
and then like when it's foggy it's like all hazy it makes you think creepy. of like for some reason i'm thinking of the forest whenever we watched um what was the name of that movie we watched labyrinth um, uh, as long as there off. aren't the fire gang where they take each other's heads off and throw them I'm good. I mean, who who knows? I mean, I'm pretty sure you're part of the fire gang. Most likely. But before the production of accurate maps of Scotland in the 19th century, it was not known for certain that Ben Nevis was the highest point in Britain, and it was often thought that Ben McDewey might be higher. But they did a few surveys of both peaks in 1846 and 1847, and Ben Nevis was confirmed to be the highest. Following these surveys, there were plans to build a cairn on top of Ben McDewey to make its height even taller than Ben Nevis, but they never did those. They, they, they never went through with that. So, I'm gonna sound really dumb here. What's a cairn? It's a mound mound of stones set up as a memorial or a marker. So just basically, they were gonna pile a bunch of rocks on top of it to make it taller. But I don't think that's how that works. Like, I, I don't think that's how that works either. But that's what they were gonna do. <laughs> But the summit of the mountain has a direction indicator that was set up in 1925 by the Cairngorm Club of Aberdeen in memory of former President Alexander Copeland. The indicator shows you the directions of the most noteworthy mount mountains that can be seen from the summit in clear weather. The name Ben McDewey has two possible origins. The first is that it's named after the McDuffs and that the Gaelic name, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that because I'm not going to get that one right, translates to McDuff's Hill. The second is the name that's derived from another word that means black pig because the shape of the mountain itself is apparently looks like a giant black pig is laying on its side. What? Yeah, apparently this, this mountain looks like a big pig. It's also noted that Queen Victoria, who was 40 at the time, hiked to the summit on the 7th of October in 1859. After her experience, she wrote, it had a sublime and solemn effect, so wild, so solitary, no one but ourselves and our little party there. I had a little whiskey and water as the people declared pure water would be too cold or too chilling. I like that. I just had a little whiskey and water. You, know, so you, you got to cut your water with whiskey because you're up so high, pure water is, is going to be too cold. Ben McDewey is very isolated and apparently also very cold. Some places on the slopes have snow that just stays all year round, no matter what season it is. Oh, um, I bet that's beautiful, though. Yeah, it's like in like the postcards and stuff. You see like the snow-capped mountains and stuff. Yeah. I'm guessing it's something like that. The geology is different when compared to mountains we, we, we're used to here in the United States because the sides of Ben McDewey are mostly rock that's made out of granite and diorite. Not like Minecraft. Well, diorite it's, in real life, I don't know if you've ever seen photos of it. It's actually quite a beautiful material. This mountain is also very gravelly, and there's not a whole lot of grass that grows there. The grass that, that is there, it's focused mainly in the valleys and some of the gentler slopes, and there's no trees on the mountain, no grass grows on the summit. The Appalachians, in comparison, are lush with trees and grass and covered in dirt for the most part, but apparently this mountain is very rocky, gravelly, and there's no grass or trees. That's crazy, because you know, where I live, we're not far from the Appalachian Trail, and to me, that's what a mountain looks yeah. like. That's the only mountains I know is the ones that are covered in trees. So, the Gray Man, or I'm not going to attempt to pronounce the, the Gaelic name unless you want to you wanna attempt that, because... I'm fear... Liu more. Close enough. Mammy Louie. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Louie's going to hunt Louis. me down, fly over from Scotland, and smack me for that. <laughs> I can hear Louie typing right now as we speak. He's just like, I sense a disturbance in the force. Somebody has just murdered my language. <laughs> yes. But the Grey Man is a supernatural entity or presence felt on the slopes of Ben McDewey. It is described as 10 feet in height. It has deep gray fur, long pointed claws on its hands and feet, pointed ears, and is able to lift big boulders with ease. Also, apparently he likes to do yoga and sip chai lattes on the weekends. <laughs> I will say, I love Ranger's sense of humor. <laughs> Same. It's, it's perfect. <laughs> like, I just imagine, so I don't know if you've ever seen them, but one of our clients at work sells yoga clothes, and they have these ones, they're... They're like hot pants with like a really high waist, but they're almost like kind of like underwear. Like they're super, super short, but they're good for doing yoga because you have to like move around and be flexible and stuff like that. And I just imagine this big, hairy, 10 foot Yeti in these yoga hot pants. <laughs> do, do you know what I thought about whenever I read deep gray fur, long pointed claws, pointed ears and able to lift big boulders with these? No. Bubba. The, the gray man is literally just Bubba. He vacations out there on the mountain on the weekends. 
Oh, okay. If that's not creepy enough, he's said to be preceded by an eerie, disconcerting presence and the feeling of being watched. And also, faint laughter or singing sliding upon the tendrils of the fog and mist as you climb the sides of Ben McDewey. Okay. At first, I was like, Yeti. Just sounds like a Yeti. It's okay. Mm -hmm. And then you add in laughter and singing. Mm Mm-hmm. Remind me never to go to northern Scotland. I mean, there's probably some sort of creature like this just about anywhere, so I mean... I don't know. Pennsylvania has the squonk, and I'm ha- I'm kind of happy with just having that. Fair enough. So supposedly there are some photos of footprints associated with the, the gray man, but Ranger was unable to find them. They, they apparently they did a lot of digging and couldn't find it. So they also could not find the origin of this story. So we don't know where the first encounter with this gray man is. The um... it's like Slender Man, where it's just like automatically appeared, and then everyone's like. It's been since the 1900s, and really, it was just some dude with a Photoshop. Like, it's always been there. No, no, it's just Jeff. (laughs) I really hope that the gray man's name is Jeff. But it has to be spelled uh, G-off instead Mm -hmm. of J-E-F-F. Yes. So now we're getting into the good part of the story here. Now we're getting to the interesting stuff. So Ben McDewey's famous Gray Man first hit the headlines in 1925 when the Cairn Gorm Club Journal, that's a mouthful, a published mouthful. a story recounting the incredible tale that detailed that year's annual general meeting of the Cairn Gorm Club in Aberdeen by the club's honorary president, Professor John Norman Colley. In addition to being the first professor of organic chemistry at the University of London and a fellow of the Royal Society, Collie was seen as one of the most proficient and esteemed mountaineers of the time. Collie's wide climbing experience ranged from the Himalayas to the Rockies. He was described as shy and reserved with strangers. Must have been a shock to everyone whenever the guest speaker recounted an experience he claimed occurred on the summit of Ben McDewey in 1891. A quote from him, that little experience he had is, I was returning from the cairn on the summit in a mist when I began to think I heard something else than merely the noise of my own footsteps. Every few steps I took, I heard a crunch, and then another crunch, as if someone was walking after me, but taking steps three or four times the length of my own. I said to myself, this is nonsense. I listened and heard it again, but could see nothing in the mist. As I walked on, and the eerie crunch, crunch, sounded behind me, I was seized with terror and took to my heels, staggering blindly among the boulders for four or five miles, nearly down to Rothy Mercus Forest. Whatever you make of it, I do not know, but there is something very queer about the top of Ben McDewey, and I will not go back there again by myself, I know. But today's skeptics maintain that the story was fictitious, perhaps the result of a drunken storyteller, or Kali annoyed that he was unexpectedly asked to speak at a climbing club dinner in Edinburgh, with no previous notice, stood up and made up a tale. No matter what the reason, once his tale was made public, the floodgates were opened and reports of the Gray Man came flooding in. And the majority of these stories, nobody saw any ghost or apparition, with many climbers reporting hearing a crunching noise and overcoming, o- being overcome by a feeling of apprehension. It kind of does sound like one dude told a story and everyone heard it and they're like, oh yeah, I had, I had a similar experience. Because <laughs> again, it's all... Everyone else heard the crunching noise and also had the feeling of nervousness and like being watched and stuff like that. So, which they probably went in there with because they were like, Oh, there's there's the gray man, and they were already yeah. nervous. And then, whether the crunch was an echo or something else, like a rabbit running, yeah, it but could have been anything, but it, it could have also been the gray man, or it could have just been, uh, you know, Jeff, yes, Jeff, the gray man. The most famous sighting of the Gray Man was detailed in the June 1958 issue of The Scots. A man named Alexander Tunian, after 10 days of climbing in the Cairngorms in October 1943, reached the summit of Ben McDewey as dense mists rolled in from a a nearby mountain, Larig Gu. Tunian noted, I am not unduly imaginative, but my thought flew instantly to the well-known story of Professor Colley and the fear of the big gray man. Then I felt the reassuring weight of the loaded revolver in my pocket. <laughs> grasping the, the butt, I peered at, heh, <laughs> grasping the butt. So, oh my God, it took me a second to realize you were talking about the gun. Uh-huh. I was like, wait, he, did he just 
Did he just, he, he just grab he just the gray man's butt? Sure it was there. <laughs> hey, look, it's the gray man. I'm gonna touch the butt. But we're actually talking about the butt the, of the, the gun. The butt of the gun. Okay. The maturity of this podcast has just been shown in all R of its Ranger glory. Probably knew this was gonna happen too when he typed that. He was like, "I know where they're going with this." I peered about in the mist here, rent and tattered by the eddies of wind. A strange shape loomed up and receded, came charging at me, and without hesitation, I whipped out the revolver and fired three times at the figure. When it still came on, I turned and hared down the path, reaching Glendary in a time that I have never bettered. You may ask, was it really the big gray man? Frankly, I think it was. Many times since then I have traversed Ben McDewey in the mist. He camped out in the open. He camped on its summit for ten days, on, on end on different occasions, often alone and always with an easy mind. For on that day, I am convinced, I shot the only big gray man my imagination will ever see. Also, Alastair Borthwick's superb 1939 book about climbing in Scotland. It's titled Always a Little Further. It relates the accounts of two climbers he knew who had experienced what, was, what by then was becoming known as the Grey Man. The first was alone, heading over McDewey for Corur on a night when the snow had a hard, crisp crust through which his boots broke at every step. He reached the summit, and it was while he was descending the slopes which fall towards the Larig that he heard footsteps behind him. The footsteps not in rhythm of his own, but occurring only once for every three steps he took. I felt a queer crinkly feeling in the back of my neck, he told me, but I said to myself, this is silly, there must be a reason for it. So I stopped and the footsteps stopped, and I sat down and tried to reason it out, but I couldn't see anything. There was a moon about somewhere, but the mist was fairly thick. The only thing I could make of it was that when my boots broke through the snow crust, they made some sort of echo. But then every step should have echoed, and not just this regular one in three. I was scared stiff. I got up and walked on, trying hard not to look behind me. I got down all right, and the footsteps stopped a thousand feet above the larig. And I didn't run, but if anything had so much as said boo behind me, I'd have been down to Corora like a streak of lightning. And I don't blame him. The second man's experience was roughly similar. He was on McDewey and alone. He heard footsteps, and he was climbing in daylight in the summer. But so dense was the mist that he was working by compass, and visibility was almost as poor as it would have been at night. The footsteps he heard were made by something or someone trudging up the fine screes which decorate the upper parts of the mountain. A thing not extraordinary in itself, though the steps were only a few yards behind him, but exceedingly odd when the mist suddenly cleared and he could see nothing on the mountain. At that point, devoid of cover of any kind. Did the steps follow yours exactly? I asked him. No, he said. That was the funny thing. They didn't. They were regular, but the queer thing was that they seemed to come once for every two and a half steps I took. He thought it queer still that I told him the other man's story. You see, he was long-legged and six feet tall, and the first man was only five foot seven. Once I was out with a search party on McDewey, and on the way down, after an unsuccessful day, I asked some of the gamekeepers and stalkers who were there with us what they thought of it all. They worked on McDewey, so they should know. Had they seen the gray man? Did he exist, or was it just a story? And they looked at me for a few seconds, and then one said, We do not talk about that. And that's it. That is all the major sightings of the gray man. Most of them talk about a feeling and getting creeped out, and they leave. At least, that's the stories of people that have actually come back off of the mountain. Well, the one guy saw something. Yeah, he saw something. Doesn't know if it was like him, him imagining things because he had read the story and then went to the mountain or... It's something. He, at least he saw something. It wasn't just footsteps. Now, could it... I know they say it's 10 feet tall. And I know you and I always like to kind of talk about other possibilities. Probably mostly just so we're not scared ourselves. <laughs> at least that's my reason. Most likely, yeah. <laughs> but could it be like... I don't know what I don't I have a feeling it's probably not a very correct term to use, but like a mountain man, some guy who is a recluse and a hermit that lives up there by himself and he wants people to leave him alone. So I mean, that's also likely as well, because I mean, my thought actually was what if it's just a really tall guy living up there on the mountain and he's just, you know, hunted animals and living off the land and like the big the gray fur is his fur coat. I didn't even think about that part. It's, I it's thought it was a, like just a costume a, or something. No, like, I'm just rah. thinking it's just a mountain man who's just took animal furs and made clothing out of it to keep himself warm up on the snowy mountains. Yeah, like very Game of Thronesy. Yeah. 
you know the I don't know if you watch Game of Thrones, but the guys yes. at the Night Watch, which was in the uh, the wildlings, the, yeah, in in the in the tundra, yeah, they wore furs, they wore animal and, skins, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and if it's a mountain man, chances are he doesn't shave, so fuzzy face, fur on his shoulders and his arms, keeping him warm. I mean, the throwing boulders part, though. I mean, I guess if you like. If he understands how like a lever or a pulley works, he could make like a trebuchet. Yeah, but then again, we didn't really have a story of I don't know where the whole lifting boulders thing came from because we didn't really have a story of anyone seeing a gray man lifting a boulder. True. So True. I'm not sure where that came from, uh, unless they're just like assuming that because he's ten foot tall and it's a big yeti creature that he can lift boulders. I'm I'm not sure. There's a few theories on what exactly the Gray Man is. There are some who say the Gray Man is a cousin of Bigfoot and the Yeti. Those two are an elusive creature of the mountains who stay to themselves unless it thinks you're encroaching on its territory or finds you particularly interesting. Maybe it just likes the way you smell. You don't think uh, Bigfoot and Yeti had a baby? I wonder what that would look like. The Gray Man? I mean, well, the is Yeti big, is like... I'm not familiar with the Yeti too much, so like, but I know it's like in the Arctic. But there was a North big America, family reunion Yetis. somewhere one time, and Bigfoot had a few too many to drink, and... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe that's something to do with the whole chai lattes and yoga. Who knows? Another theory that's on here that's that's even more interesting, I think, is that it's a physical manifestation of the mountain brought forth by people's conscious, unconscious thoughts, otherwise known as a tulpa. Tulpa are magic forna formations generated by a powerful concentration of thought. Basically, people have such a powerful view of the mountain and surrounding area that they conjure this being into the physical world and experience it as a result. That's crazy. So I actually have heard of a tulpa before because I watched the show Supernatural. There was an episode about a tulpa. It's a good yeah. show. I'm not sure it needed 15 seasons, but it had some highlights. Anyway, <laughs> speaking of Supernatural... <laughs> The next theory is just as supernatural. There are some who believe Ben McDewey is one of the liminal spaces on the planet. Such liminal spaces would be like the Bermuda Triangle and others, where it's just a place where the veil between this world and another or the next is thin, and so the Gray Man is protecting this area, making sure that humans don't wander into the other world without knowing it. I kind of like kinda, that idea. Yeah, I like that idea too. That's really cool. But if you want to get boring with it, uh, th then we have the last explanation. Uh, one can lead into the other. People say that Gray Man of Ben McDewey is nothing more than someone dealing with oxygen deprivation, fatigue, or acute feelings of isolation when ascending the mountain. Adding on to this, there's the natural phenomenon called the Brocken Spectre. It is an optical illusion that occurs when you're climbing up a slope and the sun casts your shadow on the fog banks around you and creates a shadow two or three times your own size. Probably the most likely, but yeah. right, the most boring. Who needs boring? No, there's a big Yeti on that mountain. That's what I'm sticking with. So that's all we know about the Gray Man. And in conclusion, the Cairngorms are some of the most beautiful and biodiverse areas of the British Isles and are home to more than a few spooks and legends besides the Gray Man, which I'm sure we'll cover in some future episodes. But the big Gray Man of Ben McDewey has left an indelible mark on the Scottish myths surrounding the Cairngorms. So if you fancy climbing up the steep, craggy, scree-filled slopes of Ben McDewey, just be sure to keep an eye on the path and the other on the rolling fog banks, otherwise you just might meet the gray man of Ben McDewey, and you might not be as lucky as Kali and live to tell the tale. Hey guys, it's Mo here, and I wanted to take just a second to talk to you about Anchor.fm. When Kraken and I decided to start the podcast, we had no idea what we were doing. And we went out there and searched to see what we could find to help us because you have to not only create the audio and the podcast itself, but you also have to upload it to all the different services. And ugh, how do you do that? So we found Anchor and it has been a godsend. Anchor has tools that allow you to record and edit right from your phone or your computer, so you don't even have to have fancy editing software to do it. You can also, when using Anchor, you can distribute it to all the listening platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. I know Stitcher's on there, Radio Public, it's amazing. 
and it's all in one place. If you guys followed me when I was streaming, you know that I am all about streamlining everything to a single application to do it all. And that is what Anchor does for us. Plus, big point here, Anchor's totally free. So you can either download the Anchor app from the App Store on your phone, or you can go to anchor.fm to get started. I highly suggest it, and I hope you will enjoy it if you, too, are starting your own podcast. So next on our list, we have the Flannan Isle Lighthouse Mystery. It took me a minute to, to like figure out where I had heard this story from, but actually there's a movie based off of it. It's uh, Robert Eggers' The Lighthouse. It's, it's a pretty good movie. It's, it's not straightforward. It, it makes you think, which we all know that I don't do much of. So You said it. Yes, I mean, yes, we I were did. all thinking it, but you said it. Yeah, I, think, I mean, I was like, we were all thinking it, so I might as well say it. But it's a good movie. I, I liked it, and it, it kind of goes with this story here. But the Flannan Isles Lighthouse is a lighthouse near the highest point on Ellen Moore, one of the Flannan Isles in the outer Herbrides off the west coast of Scotland. The Flannan Isles chain is about 0.6 square miles, or if you want to get very technical, 170 hectares? I've never even heard of a hectare. I have not either, but I thought it'd be worth throwing in there. Someone probably does. Yeah, it's highest Ranger. Point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Ranger does, Ranger's but the we don't. person in the world. I mean, I'm sure Allie knows, because, okay, you know, fair. teacher, but, you know. She's an English teacher, crack. But, but still, you, you can't, I mean, let's, moving on. I can't breathe. They're going to murder us. They're going to murder us. This is the episode where we lose all of our viewers and our team. <laughs> to be a teacher, don't you have to know things? About what you teach. No, 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 no. You can understand. Teachers know things. Like they're they're supposed to know a vast majority of things. I hear typing. What are you doing? You calling me out? You're calling me out. How dare? Listen, that was me complimenting Allie. I was saying she's smart. She knows things. It just came out hurts. weird, like everything else I say. My face hurts. Same. Many hours later, its highest point is 374 feet or 114 meters above sea level. It is also called the Seven Hunters because there are seven isles in the area. Some are nothing more than just rocks sticking above the surface. The lighthouse itself is 75 feet or 23 meters high. The lighthouse was designed by David Allen Stevenson of the Northern Lighthouse Board. Construction, which began in 1895 and finished in 1899, was undertaken by George Lawson, of Ruther Glen at a cost of 1,899 pounds, which included the lighthouse itself, docks or landing areas, stairs, and railway tracks. All of these materials that were used for all of this had to be hauled up the 180, uh, sorry, 148 foot or 45 meter cliffs directly from supply boats. So I bet that was fun. After all of this and they got everything built, the lighthouse was first lit on the 7th of December, 1899. The purpose of the railway tracks was to facilitate the transport of provisions for the keepers and fuel for the light up the steep slopes from the landing docks by means of a cable-hauled railway. This was powered by a small steam engine which was stored in a shed adjoining the lighthouse. The track descended from the lighthouse towards the west and curved around to the south. In the approximate center of the island, it forked by means of a set of hand-operated points, humorously dubbed Clapham Junction, in reference to a railway junction in London. The tracks then branched to the east landing dock while the other branch curved back to the west to serve the west landing. Situated in a small inlet on the island's south coast, the cargo was carried in a small four-wheeled rail cart. It's interesting to note that the carts had a built-in pulley system that kept them on course during the journey. They also had installed posts in certain areas to make sure the cart wouldn't go too far off, or it wouldn't go too far if it happened to go off the rails. But it's worth stressing that this place is very remote. It is 20 miles or 32 kilometers from the shore. There is no one and nothing else out there, except maybe wild sheep and birds on some of the other small islands. So getting into the spooky part of this story, the first sign that something was amiss at the lighthouse was on the 15th of December in 1900. The ship Arctor noted in its log that the lighthouse was not operating in poor weather conditions when it landed in Leith. 
which is a borough in Edinburgh. They reported this to the Northern Lighthouse Board. The matter was further complicated by adverse weather that kept the relief ship, the Hesperus, from going out to the lighthouse on the 20th. It took six more days before the relief ship made its way out to the lighthouse from Lewis. The lighthouse was manned by three men, James Ducat, Thomas Marshall, and Donald MacArthur, with a rotating fourth man spending time on shore. On arrival, the crew and relief keeper, Joseph Moore, found that the flagstaff had no flag. None of the usual provision boxes had been left on the landing stage for restocking, and more ominously, none of the lighthouse keepers were there to welcome them ashore. Jim Harvey, the captain of the Hesperus, attempted to reach them by blowing the ship's whistle and firing a flare, but this was unsuccessful. A boat was launched and Joseph Moore was put ashore alone. He found the entrance gate to the compound and the main door both closed, the beds were unmade, and the clock was unwound. Returning to the landing stage with this grim news, he then went back up to the lighthouse with Hesperus's second mate and a sailor. A further search revealed that the lamps had been cleaned and refilled, and a set of oilskins was found, suggesting that one of the keepers had left the lighthouse without them, and there was no sign of any of the keepers neither inside the lighthouse nor anywhere on the island. That's horrifying. Yeah, just getting to the island and being like, I know we left three men here. Well, and there's like absolutely no sign. Like there's no struggle, there's no blood, there's no suicide note, there's... They're just gone. And it's worth noting for those that don't know, because it's a weird name for it, but the, the oil skins that they found, it's basically those, like the, the waders things, is like to protect them from like water. So the Hesperus left Moore and three other crew members on the island to tend the lighthouse and made its way back to the Isle of Lewis. Harvey had sent a telegram that same day to the NLB that stated, a dreadful accident has happened at the Flannans. The three keepers, Ducat, Marshall, and the occasional MacArthur, have disappeared from the island. The clocks were stopped, and other signs indicated that the accident must have happened a week ago. Poor fellows, they must have been blown over the cliffs or drowned trying to secure a crane. I would like to believe it was just an accident, but it seems weird that all three of them disappeared at the exact same time. Yeah... So, meanwhile, Moore and the three crew members of the Hesperus conducted a thorough search of the lighthouse complex, which turned up nothing but a set of the oil skins, suggesting that one of the keepers had ventured out in just his shirt sleeves. So, just like his underclothes, basically, the undershirt and his leggings and stuff like that. So, like, he just went out there with the bare minimum. I know this is not what you meant, but when you said leggings, I think of like the, you know, the ones with all the patterns on them and stuff. Oh my God, the yoga pants. He went out in his yoga pants. Yes. I like you probably meant like long johns. That's the word I was looking for, but leggings came out. So I yeah, like the so idea now I have, of, uh, I have this idea in my head of this burly sailor type man with like the beard and like the little hat in like a white t-shirt and black leggings with neon flowers all over them. The men turned their attention to the landing platform on the west side of the island. Here, there was plenty of evidence that the island had recently been hit by a massive storm. A supply box had been smashed open and its contents were strewn across the ground. Despite being over 100 feet above sea level, iron railings on the side of a path had been bent and twisted out of shape. Part of a railway track had been torn from its concrete moorings and a huge rock weighing more than a ton had been displaced. Turf had also been ripped up from the tops of the cliffs 200 feet above sea level, and there was no sign of the three keepers. That is a wicked... That almost sounds like, you know, right now the Americas got hit with Hurricane Ian. Looking at the news coverage of the stuff down, like, your way, Florida, etc., that sounds like a wicked, wicked hurricane to be doing this kind of Yeah, uh, to, to rip railway tracks out of concrete, yeah. A boulder more than a ton... Yeah, that's, that's a massive storm. So, I mean, that tells me that, like, it's not out of question that, like, they got blown off the island. So, on December 29th, the Robert Moorhead, an NLB superintendent, arrived to conduct an official investigation into the incident. Moorhead had hired all the men at the lighthouse and knew them personally, so he examined the clothes left behind by the men in the area surrounding the lighthouse and concluded... And I quote, from evidence which I was able to procure, I was satisfied that the men had been on duty up until dinner time on Saturday the 15th of December. They had gone down to secure a box in which the mooring ropes, landing ropes, etc. were kept and which was secured in a crevice in the rock about 110 feet or 34 meters above sea level. 
and that an extra large sea had rushed up the face of the rock and gone above them, coming down with an immense force and had swept them completely away. Oh, that is heartbreaking. He also stated that the damage to the west side of the island was hard to believe unless seen. Unfortunately, Ducat left, left behind a wife and four children, and MacArthur had a wife and two children. After the initial wave of reports about the incident, the local populace was not content with the official statements of what happened at the lighthouse. Over the years, there have been speculation that the men were eaten by a sea serpent, hopped on a passing vessel to start new lives, kidnapped by foreign spies, swept away by a giant seabird, a ship full of ghosts had taken them away, and even that they were abducted by UFOs. I feel like there is a varied extent of how crazy some of those theories are. Uh -huh. Like, you know what? They ditched their lives, they hopped on a ship, maybe they went somewhere to make lots of money. Okay, a UFO. Those are two ends of a spectrum. <laughs> they, got, they, they got kidnapped by ghost pirates. Yeah, or swept away by a giant bird. Or a giant sea serpent. All of those theories... And even locally, the Phantom of the Seven Hunters was blamed. We'll, we'll, we'll cover that later. Okay, I was going to say, the, the what? <laughs> the Phantom of the Seven Hunters. The speculation was heightened by the 1912 ballad Flannan Isle by Wilfred Wilson Gibson. And a small excerpt of that is, Yet, as we crowded through the door, we only saw a table spread for dinner, meat, and cheese, and bread, but all untouched and no one there. As though when they sat down to eat, ere they could even taste, alarm had come, and they in haste had risen and left the bread and meat, for at the table, head a chair, lay tumbled on the floor. This ballad added to the mythos of the Flannan Isle, but this ballad is purely fiction. Everything in the reports from both Moore and Moorhead state that the lighthouse interior was in good condition. There was no food laid out, no chair knocked over, even the beds were made. Then there surfaced a mysterious logbook from the lighthouse. In it, the log, written by Marshall, supposedly states that on the 12th through the 14th there was a storm unlike anything they had ever seen. It also states that Ducat had been very quiet and MacArthur was weeping. The fact that MacArthur was said to be weeping in regards to a storm is unusual, as he was a seasoned lighthouse attendant and a mariner who was also a burly man prone to fighting. You'd think he'd seen his fair share of bad storms in his time, but on the 13th, the log states that the three men had been praying as this storm continued, which is also strange as the lighthouse they were in was 150 feet above sea level and built on solid rock. They would have known they were safe, and it is also worth mentioning that in other areas like Lewis, there are also no records of a storm on the dates of the 12th through the 14th. But on the 15th, the log has a final entry that states, Storm ended, sea calm, God is over all. Investigators later found all the, these logbooks were fabricated later to help sensationalize the 1912 ballad that we discussed earlier. Ah, uh, okay, that, that makes sense, sadly. Yeah. That would have been an interesting end had it been an actual storm, like a weird storm that just popped up and wasn't on record. Yeah, especially because Lewis was, I guess, the closest place, but it wasn't close. You know, they and had to was, take like a I said, ship like the nearest shore was like 20 miles away. Yeah, so what if it was some sort of crazy localized storm? Like something in yeah. that bay? I mean, weird or... stuff happens in the Bermuda Triangle, so I mean, strange pop-up storm isn't that off. Yeah, but it's sad that it was fabricated, because that... Yeah. That could have like led to some like really crazy investigation and like some maybe geological surveys and trying to find out what you know could have kicked up the yeah. wind and caused this crazy storm. But you know. but we mentioned the Phantom of the Seven Hunters earlier, so going into that a little bit, according to local legend, Saint Flannan, an Irish missionary and preacher, built his hermitage on the island in the seventh century B.C.E., and pilgrims subsequently came to see his home but only after removing their hats and turning 360 degrees clockwise immediately after coming ashore. It still stands today and is not but a few hundred feet from the lighthouse itself, and it is believed that his spirit still roams the area and even the isles bear his name. Also, in medieval times, shepherds would bring their sheep to Flannan Isle to graze in the summer, but none of these superstitious peasants would stay overnight. At that time, there was a strong local belief that hundreds of years before, in pre-Christian times, the island was where the pagan Picts took their dead and burnt them on funeral pyres. For these reasons, it had been extremely difficult for Moorhead to find any men among the local population willing to serve in the brand new lighthouse on Flannan Isle. 
Because, you know, who wants to go to an island where it's said that, you know, they, they yeah, had a lot that's... of funeral pyres and stuff on? That's very similar to, you know, in America, they always say it was an Indian burial ground or something like yeah. that. So any place where you have hundreds of lost souls in a small area. Probably don't want to be hanging around there, no. let alone building a lighthouse. All of this wrapped together probably birthed the Phantom of the Seven Hunters legend. The legend states that when people go missing on the isles, that the spirits of the islands, angry at the modernity visiting their shores and the interlopers that it brings, they spirit the offending persons away, never to be seen again. Even Joseph Moore, the relief lighthouse keeper, reported that he had felt a very strange and eerie feeling as he walked through the deserted lighthouse. I don't blame him. Well, like, Same. I would, just the fact that these three men just disappeared into thin air is enough to give me a very strange and eerie sense. Yeah, they, they're just like, there's no trace of them at all, no footprints, no nothing. They're just, they're just gone. The fates of the three keepers of the Flannan Lighthouse will never be truly known, but there are some uh, plausible theories outside the supernatural that, supernatural that have been posited. One of the men, through psychosis or rage, had murdered the other two men, tossed their bodies into the sea, and remorseful after the fact, threw themselves into the waves. This is somewhat plausible on the surface, as when in close quarters, tempers tend to flare. MacArthur was a uh, known brawler as, as well. He was also known to have a temper. Not a good person the, to put in close quarters with others. No, not on, not on an island for long periods of time. No. An interesting aside is, I know the other week we had talked about the 3D printed houses that they were trying to develop for Mars. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that they worked on in on Earth was an experiment of trying to find a crew that they locked these people in this small enclosure. I believe there was an outdoor garden or something like that, but if they left the enclosure, they had to put on the the suits that they were going to go out onto an alien uh, yeah. planet and yeah. all that stuff. So obviously they don't do that often. They only did that when they had to, when they had certain tasks to perform, etc. So you couldn't just like walk outside, and get a breath of fresh air. And they locked them in for a set amount of time to see not only what happened and they were monitored and I guess you could say studied for like the psychology and all that stuff to see what would happen if you took, I think it was like eight people and put them in a small enclosure for a long period of time where they literally could not leave. It was actually a really interesting experiment and they did learn a lot. Very early version of that. So they were, now they could have gone outside, gone for a walk. You know, there was nature, there was breathable air. You know, these three men were kind of isolated and I guess you'd almost say like in captivity. It could have been something like that where the longer it went, tempers flared, things annoyed you, and it built up over time until someone just snapped. Yeah. But continuing that, it's also theorized that the mercury bath that the lens for the lighthouse floated on drove one of the men mad, and that he subsequently went on a rampage. But the fact that there were no signs of a struggle and that no blood was found on the island, this theory is speculative at best. Well, it depends on where it happened. Because if Fair. it was yeah. somewhere where waves could wash the blood away in a few days. Now, obviously, it didn't happen in the lighthouse. But yeah, I, I think I think those are good. I think that's a good theory, a solid theory that one of them killed the other two and then either took his own life or just disappeared. The next one is that there, were, there was a storm on the 15th of December and two men went to secure equipment and never returned, having been swept off the island due to the storm. The third man went to go find the others and suffered the same fate. This is the predominant theory and the one Mr. Moorhead states as the official reason for the disappearance. Though there are some holes in this theory as like why would these experienced mariners and lighthouse keepers risk going out into a storm and wouldn't they have seen the storm coming and secured everything before it happened? But this has never been explained. But there are records that Marshall had been fined five shillings by the NLB when his equipment was washed away in, pre in a previous storm, and he was determined not to, uh, not to have this happen again and brought another person with him to check on the equipment. So I feel like this is actually... I don't know if you ever watched the show Deadliest Catch. I but have. I've seen it. Yeah. yeah seeing 
that show and seeing those types of personalities of the seafaring folk, I could actually see them thinking they secured their equipment. All of a sudden, the storm starts blowing it around. And so many times you see these guys go and do something just astronomically crazy to secure something and almost being blown off the ship, almost being washed away. And there are sadly many, many sailors who do not survive it. And I can see someone, especially if they were, you know, trying to avoid another fine, especially if money is tight, that is quite possible. A new theory was posited when researchers looked at the geography of the island. The coastline of Ellen Moore is deeply indented with narrow gullies called geos. The west landing, which is situated in such a geo, terminates in a cave. In high seas or storms, water would rush into the cave and then explode out again with considerable force. So it was possible that MacArthur may have seen a series of large waves approaching the island and knowing that likely danger to his colleagues, ran down to warn them only to be washed away as well in the violent swell. And this would also account for the oil skin being left in the lighthouse, but not why the door to the lighthouse and the gate to the compound were closed. The wind? Maybe, but if they were like closed in such a way that they were latched. Oh, that's a good Then point. it would kind of be a little yeah. odd. But it's very interesting. I've never heard of a geo before. But in, I haven't in this... either. That's, that's new for me. Yeah, that's crazy. Like, that's just insane to think that this water, like, rushes into the cave and then explodes out. Yeah, wow. I guess because, it, like, it goes in and then it doesn't have a way to, to go anywhere after that. So, like, all of that force just kind of, like, gets sucked back out. And because there's no air in there due to all the water, it just explodes out. Would it have been enough to move the boulder and pull up the tracks, do you think? I have no idea, because like I said, I've never heard of that before, so I've, I've never even seen how powerful that is. Uh, so the next one, and the wind is a deciding factor on this one, the following example is to show how strong the wind gets in that region. According to another report from the NLB, Alastair Henderson, who weighed 224 pounds, or 124 kilos, had been carrying a fridge between his assigned lighthouse at Rue Ri and another building in the compound when a gust of wind blew him and the fridge several feet. The lighthouse is northeast of the Isle of Skye and is at the entrance of Loch Yu. People think that the men left the lighthouse to investigate a strange noise or a banging on the door and a powerful wind funneled between the side of the lighthouse and the outer wall picked those men up and blew them over the wall straight over the 300 foot cliff just 30 feet away on the other side of the perimeter wall. So the, the conclusion for this is that we will most likely never know what happened to these three men on that day, but we're left with more questions than answers, and this tale will continue to regale and enthrall us for as long as the light blinks on that bleak, windswept island jutting out from the frothing Atlantic Sea. Ranger should be a poet. Yes. Both of these stories have been crazy, yeah. and I think it's a good intro to Spooky Month because they're not... Like, I'm not going to have nightmares tonight. Yeah, they're not overly spooky, but it's like... I have a lot of questions. That's odd. Yeah. Yeah, I have a lot of questions. You have a lot of questions. None of them we will probably ever get the answer to. Exactly. It's it's like, um, feels so long ago, but our very first episode, uh, Charles Morgan. Yeah. So many... I still have quite... Like, I still poke around at that a little bit here and there. Just like, what happened? So these are going to add to that list where I'm going to be like... Have they learned those anything rabbit holes more just... about Flannan Isles? Yeah, those never-ending rabbit holes. Thank you for sharing, Cracko. Yes. I need to thank Ranger for doing stories. the research and writing these up, because those were very interesting stories. Yes, thank you, Ranger. You're amazing, and we love you. And I want to say, <laughs> he might kill me for saying this on the podcast and in public, but I thought it was absolutely adorable. Uh, we have a contact us form on the website, and he filled it out. <laughs> We have a group chat with him where we talk to him every single day, but he sent us an email through the website. I need to go do that now. And you can too, guys. Whether Although, it's just, you know, sending us information about our ext- car's extended warranty or, you know. Well, any if anybody wants to suggest stories, you can either do it through the website or on our Discord. And another thing about the website before we go is that we have now added a new section 
So there are some stories that aren't quite enough for a podcast episode. So we now have posts where some of this information on certain things are now available only on the website. And our first one is a ranger story. So I highly suggest you go check that one out. As always, make sure to check out our website for all the show notes, sources, and more information at thesquonkinthehag.com. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and bonk the notification bell to get alerts for new episodes and content. All right, Cracko, you ready? Okay, bye.